Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I call this episode the Flying Saucer and the Atlantean Bracelet. This is one of the most unusual stories of UFO contact I have ever heard. It has unique elements, lots of high strangeness, and I think it provides some really important and profound insights into the nature of the UFO phenomenon. This account comes from a gentleman by the name of James Santiago. He was a very wealthy, famous nightclub performer and singer. And his story begins in 1982 in Calgary, Canada. I am going to play live clips of my interview with James so you'll be able to hear his story in his own words. So in 1982, James was performing in Calgary, Canada. It was a month-long engagement. It went very well. He got standing ovations every night. And his next engagement was in Vancouver, Canada, which is on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, some hundreds of miles away on the west coast of Canada. And James was planning to fly because he absolutely hates long car rides. And then his plans changed when his makeup artist, a lady I'll call Melanie, that's not her real name, uh, wanted to introduce James to her mother. I'll call her Cleo. Turns out Melanie's mother, Cleo, is a world famous artist. She's not only famous, she's super successful, extremely wealthy, and has paintings hanging in museums and important institutions all across the United States and the world. And James, himself being an accomplished artist, was pretty excited to meet Cleo. Melanie warned him that Cleo was a very, very eccentric woman and all these strange and wild things happened to her. Uh, and although Melanie warned him about this, uh, James wasn't too concerned. He himself uh, was a little bit eccentric. And uh, being an accomplished artist, he was very excited to meet her as well. And then when he met Cleo, he was a bit taken aback because Cleo was quite strange. She was an elderly woman, well, her mid-50s, mid somewhat heavy set. She had long white hair, which she tied up in sort of a May West knot. She wore makeup in a very peculiar way with dark rings around her eyes. She was very opinionated. She had a hundred little idiosyncrasies. She was a very strong vegan. Uh, she was just a very strange woman. But James was entranced by her, and Cleo herself uh, was delighted by James, and they became good friends very quickly. And it turned out that Cleo had an engagement in Vancouver at the same time James did. And she invited James to ride along with her into Vancouver. James didn't want to do it. He hates long car rides, he told her, and he absolutely refused. But Melanie also encouraged James to go ahead. You'll have a good time. You, you guys will have fun. Uh, James didn't want to d go on this car ride, but uh, both Cleo and Melanie kept encouraging him, and finally he gave in. And as James says in his own words, she was a very strange woman, really strange, a very peculiar person, so I'm definitely not driving with her. But she worked on me for a week and a half. I cannot tell you to this day why I agreed to do it. But finally I said, okay. I caved under the pressure and I did it. So the time arrived for them to leave and Cleo and James got into the car and took off on this long, would be a two day long road trip across the Canadian Rockies. And about 15 minutes into the trip, Cleo made a very strange announcement. And I'll just let James describe what Cleo said. 
So, we get in the car, and she's got like this James Bond secret agent car. It was this old, giant, land yacht Monte Carlo, right? And it was blue, blue, blue. And it was all shiny and everything. And um, white leather on the insides. And, you know, uh, an upper scale car, but it's not, you know, like a Rolls or something like that. Anyway, so this is, it's, and it's big and square and gigantic land yacht, like those old Lincoln Continentals, you know, it was just huge. So, I get in the car with her, and I can't believe I'm getting in the car. I mean, it's just like, like, oh, God, you moron, what are you doing? I'm hating it, right? So, we start driving, and we're just pretty much quiet about 25 miles out of town where there was nothing. She stops and she says, oh, um, do you have any pennies on you? I'm like, oh yeah, I have pennies. And she says, do you have a lot? Do you have a lot of change? I said, oh, I have a box of change in my luggage. You know, just lose change. But I, it collects so much so easy, right? So I have this big box of change. Oh. And she said, well, would you mind taking out all the pennies in the, the quarters that are sandwiched with copper? No, why? And she's like, well, um, I think you should know I'm being followed by UFOs. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Here I am in the middle of fucking nowhere in Canada with this crazy woman, right, who's being followed by UFOs and she wants to know if I have any copper. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> I, well, so did, did, well, I said, well, here, let's open the bag. So I take my, get my luggage and I take out this box of change that I have and I say, kid, and I said, come here, here, this is your lucky day to give this box of change to this kid. You know, I'm sure his mother still doesn't believe that story, but anyway, <laughs> you know, he probably got about 40 bucks in change, right? But it was just, I'm going to stop and go through every coin. I get back in the car, and she says, you don't believe me, do you? No. Well, she had her whole car, everything that was copper, replaced in silver. That's what she told me. So there was nothing. But this car had some, I mean, I don't know how many hundred thousand dollars she paid for this car because it did. It was like a James Bond car. It had all this weird stuff in it. and I, But it looked like a normal car. But her daughter told me, well, you know, my mom lives in her car. And this is a wealthy woman. A very wealthy woman. She does, you know, she can have houses everywhere. But she lives in this Monte Carlo, and she checks into a hotel and changes the hotel every two days, or every two or three days, right? But no more ever than three. And travels all over the place doing that. And her prized possessions are in that, or were in that blue car. And, uh, so I was to find out a little bit about that car as this trip progressed. So after this little incident, uh, James kind of regrets getting into the car with this very strange woman who is being followed, she says, by UFOs. Uh, but it's too late now, so he just continues the trip. And as the trip progresses, it turns out they have a really good time. They start discussing all these really interesting subjects such as ghosts, uh, Atlantis, other esoteric and spiritual subjects. Cleo basically gave James a very advanced spiritual education. And James was absolutely fascinated by this woman and just had a great time with her. So they drive into the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Around dusk, they find a restaurant, a little cafe, and have dinner. And this is when something very strange happened, something that James remembers because, particularly because of what would happen afterwards. As they were eating dinner, 
there was a table next to them where two gentlemen, two elderly gentlemen, were seated, just normal looking guys. But these two gentlemen stared at Cleo and James for the entire duration of their meal, never once took their eyes off of them. James thought this was really quite odd, and given what would happen next, he remembered this incident vividly and wonders if it was somehow connected to what would soon be the single most unusual experience of his entire life. So at any rate, they finished their dinner, got back into this blue Monte Carlo, and continued the drive into the Rocky Mountains. And James was terrified to find how steep and treacherous these mountain roads were. Uh, there were steep gorges dropping hundreds of feet uh, onto the side and mountains rising hundreds of feet all around them. And Cleo seemed to be a good driver. Uh, and as they continued the drive, they were right into the heart of the Rocky Mountains. And this is when something very peculiar happened. Cleo turned to James and said that they were about to see a UFO. And I'll just let James describe this entire incident in his own words because it's so strange. We were driving along enjoying the night and it had to be around 9 or 10 o'clock at night now. And he goes, do you feel the pressure? And I'm like, no. He goes, oh, well, you will. We're about to see a UFO. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, not believing her. Just thinking, oh, God. You know, and I'm looking at the window. And we're just driving along. And all of a sudden, I feel this pressure. It was like somebody was pushing not in a painful way, but there was definite pushing on my head and on my shoulders and just pushing my body into the seat. Yes, on my legs. Yeah, yes, my whole thing was just like pushed into the chair. Right? It was... But it, it was a palpable pressure, you know? Almost, you know, like if I pushed your head in your shoulders. Uh, like that. Strong, the whole thing. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> no, I was like surprised, of course. And then um, looked at me and smiled. And it didn't hurt at all. It was just surprising and disconcerting, you know, because I'd never experienced anything like that. So then, and then before we could say too much more, whew, Right in front of us is a UFO, a saucer-shaped UFO. Now, I did not see any individual lights on it. Like, I've heard many people see the lights, different lights, right? The entire thing glowed an exquisite turquoise, right? And it looked almost like neon light, only it was the entire craft was glowing this brilliant turquoise and I couldn't see the top we could only see the bottom of it right the round disc shape you know the classic flying saucer I would assume but we didn't see it from the side or on the top from just and it went whoom, and it just went right over the car and stayed there right exactly with the car I was looking out of the windshield like that, and I could see it. And I didn't have to move very far. I mean, it was huge, right? But it wasn't that huge. That's what surprised me. It was maybe only 15 times the size of the car. Right, but it, for considering where it had to have come from and so forth, I thought, well, it's kind of small. And it was just... And I could just look out and see this glowing disc. And I was so excited I have never been that awake in my life you know I was so in the moment and I remember it so vividly and I remember looking out and saying to myself remember this forever and for all time burn this into your memory in your mind's eye really be here because 
You're going to tell people about this, and they're not going to believe you. But you know something now for sure and certain that maybe other people don't. You know, and it was just really so in the moment and so excited. I was not the least bit afraid. I was totally um, enthusiastic and excited and hoping they would land and I'd go up and go, Welcome, wagon, you know. Maybe 40 or 50 feet above the car. It looked like pretty close, you know. Um, it scared, and she put the pedal to the metal, and we went flying around these curves like that with these tremendous gorges, right? And a little railing, like a toothpick. And I was like, oh my God, I was terrified of her driving, but I wasn't of them. I was hoping they would land. I really wanted to just get out and go, so, how it stings, you know? Uh, she said, see, I told you. And I was like, hey, well, I apologize for that. How could I have known? But I did apologize, but I did say, well, you know, the world doesn't know yet. And now I know, you know. I never thought anything like that would happen to me. And, um, it stayed with the car for a really long time. I mean, like ten minutes. And that's an eternity in that heightened state. It was long enough that I started relaxing with it. And, you know, I was really getting into it because I was just looking at it so much. But it was so beautiful, the turquoise glow of it, right? The entire thing glowed simultaneously. It didn't pulsate, and there was no sound. As the time increased, the pressure increased. And towards the end, it was starting to get uncomfortable. Like, I didn't like it, and I was getting a little bit afraid, right? Well, it just felt really weird. You know, um, it not only felt like you were going into being, being pushed into the seat, your ears felt like, um, you know, when you dived to a bottom of a swing pool and it's, you're not pressurized, you get that feeling. It's kind of like that. Um, I remember so vividly seeing the white of the dashboard and the upholstery. I mean, these are things that every time I think about this story, these images come to my mind, right? Of her driving, her feet driving, and of the whiteness of the doors, and the way they were lit by this turquoise light. I can see that in my mind's eye so perfectly, right? And that was the only light. The headlights and that. It was very bright. It was beautiful, though. It was really pretty. But it didn't send any beams down or do anything. It might have. Maybe that pressure was a beam and I didn't, couldn't see it. Because I could certainly feel it. Maybe that's what kept it perfectly with the car. I didn't really even think of that until this moment. Because I was so focusing on that, I don't remember seeing other cars. I've thought about that so many times. Yeah. Well, I wondered if we had missing time or not. I never even thought to check that. And I don't know if she did either. And we were in the middle of the stinking Rockies. One Rocky looks like another, so you can't mark the distance or where you were. I, I was scared then. But I was still excited. I still would have gotten out of the car and gone and say hello. So they're driving along. They feel this pressure on their body. This UFO appears. It's about 50 feet above their car. It's this beautiful emerald green. Cleo is screeching around these mountain roads. James is terrified of the way she's driving, but he has no fear of this object itself. He's absolutely entranced. And as he said, he felt more awake than he's ever felt in his entire life. I found this particular detail quite interesting because it's certainly something I've heard from other experiencers. I've also heard other experiencers describe this weird pressure on their body. So these are some important little details that I think lend corroboration and authenticity to his account. Because James had no interest or education on UFOs up to this point. He did not even know if they were real. 
but it was this feeling of awakeness and awareness that really affected him deeply. Now, the energy that I got out of that thing felt, I don't want to say comforting, but comfortable. Um, I was not afraid. She was afraid, but even she wasn't making me afraid. I was... Mm-mm. There's nothing to be afraid of. So the, I was excited. I was so excited. And so awake. Oh! I mean, I've awake. never been that awake in my life. That aware. That crystal clear in my consciousness. Yes, it was a state of awakeness that I don't think I've or many people ever experienced. This was an excitement. I felt an anticipatory excitement. That's what it was. And it was like a fun thing. And now their encounter moved from strange to absolutely beyond bizarre when Cleo instructed James to open the glove compartment, empty it of its contents, the maps and sunglasses and such, and press a hidden latch and remove a secret object from the bottom of the glove compartment. And I'll just let James describe what he found inside this glove compartment. She looked at me and she said, open the glove box, take everything out, reach your hand in and you'll feel the button. Push the button and the door will open. And reach in and take out the contents and put it between us. And I'm looking at her and like, Oh, okay, <laughs> you know, it's like, what am I doing with this crazy woman, right? So, open the glove box, take out the maps and sunglasses and shit, put it on the floor. And I reach in, and I can see there's a button in there, so I reach in. And now I'm like armpit deep in the, you know, glove box. I press the button, and this door goes, Kink! and it like snapped in my fingers, like, ow! <laughs> I should have had to go get one. But anyway, it came up. And I reached in, and I could feel something heavy wrapped in cloth. And I picked it up, and I pulled it out. And it was this really beautiful, but dark purple cloth, right? a velvety kind of cloth with some other kind of fabric on the outside. It was dark. I really couldn't see it, but I knew it was purple. Anyway, she said, unwrap it and put it between us. And it was heavy. And I unwrapped it. And it was this magnificent bracelet. But it was very large and very heavy. It would have to be for a man. It would just knock a woman over, right? And it was, it would fall off a woman's wrist, too, because it was big, you know. And it was thick, and it was big like that. And it weighed a lot. And it was all solid gold. And it was so intricate in all this filigree work that was just, like, magnificent. And then there were these big oval faceted stones that were sort of a seafoam green, right? And I think there were either six or seven of them set around in this. I mean, it was like for a king, definitely, you know, or someone equivalent. It was designs, but it could have been symbols that I was unaware of at that time, you know. But the workmanship, I'm an artist, and the workmanship of, it was staggering. I mean, it was just so beautiful. And the glimmering stones, and the way they were glimmering in the light with that thing over us, right? They were green about sea, that sort of sea foam. What but in between say? us. Well, I was, now, that was the other thing. I was in such sensory overload. I have a UFO over me that I never even thought I'd ever see one or that, you know, I believed there was life out there, but I didn't think it would come visiting, right, right now. And there it was. So that was really cool, and that's enough to just send you over the edge for a lifetime. But now I've got this incredible piece of art in my hands that's heavy, and it's radiating. I know it. I mean, it was something powerful, right? And she said, put it between us. And I did. And she put her hand through it. And we both had our hands through it. She said, rub it. And I rubbed it. And as we rubbed it, 
the pressure started to lift within four or five seconds. Yeah, so that's fairly immediately. And then the craft just kind of went, went up and it kind of went, eh, eh, and it was gone. So after they rubbed this bracelet and he put it back and this UFO departed, James was absolutely awestruck. Uh, he's not sure what to make of this alleged Atlantean bracelet that Cleo said she had found while diving off the coast of Spain and was led to it by some telepathic voice. Uh, he's not sure if that's true or not. He only knows that this bracelet was in fact real, very heavy, huge, and perhaps the most exquisite piece of artwork he has ever seen in his entire life. But uh, he replaced it back into the glove compartment and following this very strange encounter, he and Cleo continued the drive. Uh, they didn't really discuss much what had just happened other than to acknowledge that this UFO had appeared and moved off. But it was only moments later that James saw two UFOs a quarter mile away on the peak right opposite them between them and a gorge. So it wasn't like they could go over there and see these objects any closer. But D James described these two UFOs landed on the opposite peak about a quarter mile away. I'll just let him describe this in his own words. And then, a few minutes later as we're coming around some bend, there was two of them landed. We had stopped rubbing the bracelet. We rubbed it for a while after the crap left, but by this time we put it down. I said, what is this? You know, I just want some bracelet. Well, I can see that, but where did you get it? What is it? And she said, well, it's from Atlantis. And that she had found it while diving off the coast of Spain. And she heard this voice to tell her to go get this thing. And she found it. It told her in her ear while she was underwater diving where to get it. And she went and got it. She said, okay, now you've seen it. You are sworn to secrecy. Said, of course. And I put it back. And I put everything back the way it was. Um, then we saw those two that were landed, the two craft that were landed right next to each other. And one rocky away, but impossible to get to. There's no way we could get unless we grew wings. Right. They were right there, so that was fairly close. Those two craft were colored. I, I, one was kind of a bluish silver and the other one keep seeing is like reddish but I can't remember clearly now anymore I will never forget that one that was right over us well they're a distance away from us and they're not coming out and Gina's definitely not stopping and there's no way that I could get over there without you know certain depth but my reasoning was if they land and I go say hello and they answer I will know something and I've seen something no one ever has. I'll have that knowledge. How cool is that? I love that. We just drove down the road, kept driving, and then until they were out of our sight from other mountains. And I didn't see any more that night. But that was enough. You know? So Cleo made no acknowledgement of these other objects and they just continued their drive out of the Rocky Mountains. And around midnight, they finally got through, reached the foothills, found a hotel, and spent the evening in this hotel. It was uneventful. They woke up the next morning and spent the entire day driving into Vancouver. And finally, they reached Vancouver. They saw the bay there. Uh, and we're coming upon the Lion's Gate Bridge. It was evening when Cleo pointed out a star and told James, look at that star. 
It's not a star, it's a UFO. James did not believe her. And I'll just let James describe what happened in his own words. We drive all day and we're driving now into Vancouver. And Vancouver looks very much like San Francisco. They used to call them sister cities. It's hilly with a lot of Victorians. And there's a bridge that looks like the Golden Gate Bridge, only it's green. A sus uh, suspension bridge, right? And it's called the Lions Gate Bridge. And from where we're going, we had to cross the Lions Gate to get into Vancouver Park. So we're approaching the bridge entrance, and did you see that star? And she says, that's not a star. She said, look at that star. It's not a star. And I'm like, well, what is it? She goes, it's a UFO. And I'm like, okay. We saw a UFO for real. I believe you. No, it's been following us. I was like, how could it be following us? So, well, it has been. And she goes, well, it's not a star. And so she just keep your eye on it. And it was kind of going, but it was way up there with the stars, you know. It was the fucking star. So I thought, we're just driving onto the bridge to approach the toll gate. So we're actually right there on the bridge. And I'm watching the star, and it goes, mm -hmm. and it's like, oh my god. Okay, I believe you, I'm sorry. It's so this is all new. It went straight up, and then went, <laughs> as it went to the side, it just kind of made this line like that, you know, and then was gone. I just said, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I believe you, it's <laughs> just, this is all new for me, and you know, I'm a moron and all this. So after this star that turned out not to be a star darted off, James was super apologetic and uh, really just absolutely awestruck by these experiences he had had with Cleo and how unbelievably strange this woman truly was. But he had no choice but to believe her because he had seen UFOs now three times. And he went to his hotel, which overlooked the bay. It overlooked Stanley Park. Cleo also got a room in the hotel. Melanie flew in a short time later and she had a room below James. James had a very successful engagement in Vancouver, and he was enjoying his stay there, so he decided to stay a little longer. He had friends in Vancouver. And one evening, he went out onto his balcony, which overlooks Stanley Park, looked up, it was an overcast day, and saw strange lights in the clouds. And I'll just let James described another profound UFO sighting. About two months later, um, I was staying at this hotel that was right on the beach on the bay there. And I used to like take a shower and go out and dry my hair on the balcony and look out at the boats and the water because there was a flood out there. It was nice and just pleasant, right? So I'd go do that. So it was an overcast day. It was getting to be dusk. It was still light dusk. It wasn't dark dusk yet, but it was dusk, right? And I'm out and I look up and I see these lights up above the cloud layer. And they were kind of cool. And they were kind of like dancing around, right? And I remember they were like, well, through the cogs, they were like these light colors, you know, like a soft blue and like a soft reddish pink and, and kind of like an opalescent one, you know. But I could see the moving up above the clouds. I'm thinking, what on earth is that? I'm not thinking UFOs yet, right? Like, huh, that is so weird. Must be like, um, I thought might have the Klieg lights, you know, those big lights, they're sure. But I don't see any beams. I thought, well, that's weird. There should be beams. What is that? Right. 
and then all of a sudden they decide to show me what that is. But it's daylight in front of God and everybody right on the beach and there's a million buildings all right on that beach like that, right? And then all the people coming and going da, 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 right? So, and then Stanley Park is off to the side and Stanley Park is like Golden Gate Park all beautiful and manicured and so forth but then after uh, several acres it becomes natural wilderness and it stays real forest and everything until it hits the ocean it's totally beautiful like Stanley Park mm -hmm. so I'm looking at them and all of a sudden two of them out of the two discs come out of the cloud cover and go boom and right into the direction of Stanley Park it's like, oh my god. And those were metal disc shape again. They didn't have color once they came out of the, the cloud thing. They moved so fast I really couldn't see what color they were. But they were kind of metalish. So he saw these two objects dart off into Stanley Park. And Melanie comes running into the room. She saw them too. And they're out on the balcony reliving this incident. They cannot find Cleo. And uh, just talking about what had happened when t suddenly these same two objects come racing out of Stanley Park at treetop level, dart upwards into the clouds and are gone. And they are just absolutely amazed. Uh, they were clearly UFOs, and it was a short time later that Cleo comes running into the room. Her hair is completely disheveled. She's frightened, and she says, did you see the UFOs? And they said, yes, we saw them arrive, and we saw them leave. And Cleo said that she was out painting in Stanley Park when these two discs dropped down out of the sky and hovered directly over her, and were trying to take her. And she ran out of Stanley Park and evaded them and took refuge in the hotel room. So this was what James's fifth UFO sighting with Cleo. So it was clear to him that Cleo was telling the truth, that she was being followed by UFOs. It turns out Cleo uh, basically lived out of her Monte Carlo. She stayed in hotels two or three days at a time. She said she was being watched very closely by both the U.S. and Canadian government. And uh, she was constantly trying to evade them. Uh, a short time later, uh, Cleo, James, and Melanie were together. They were planning on going out to dinner with a friend. But it turned out James's friend had an abscess tooth and he was in a lot of pain. And Cleo offered to give him a psychic healing, but she would only do it in complete privacy. So she took James's friend into the bedroom and closed the door while Melanie and James stayed in the living room. And James couldn't help but look over when he saw a strange and eerie iridescent blue light coming from beneath the crack in the door. He thought that was very strange. And a short time later, Cleo comes out and said that James's friend is sleeping, uh, which really kind of struck James as odd because it was still very early evening. And Cleo said, don't worry, he's all right. Um, he'll probably wake up in a little bit. And sure enough, he did. James's friend came out into the living room and announced that he was completely healed and was ready to go out to dinner. And so they all went out to dinner and James's friend ordered steak. His abscess tooth was completely healed. This turned out to be the last time that James ever saw Cleo. And that was his UFO adventures with Cleo. And so I questioned James about these experiences uh, and got all the details. I've heard him tell this story many times to other people. Uh, we became quite good friends. And his story never changed, though sometimes he did add new details. But following my interview with him, I wanted to know if this was a one-off or if he had had any other unusual experiences. And James did have a lifetime of unusual experiences, paranormal events. 
He saw the ghost of his mother after she passed away when he was just a little boy. It had a number of ghost encounters, some very highly mystical encounters that he prefers to keep private and personal. Uh, He's had a number of paranormal events. And uh, I asked him questions to determine if he was a UFO contactee. Uh, Because I wasn't sure if he had possibly had missing time during this incident with Cleo. He's honestly not sure. There's no clear indication that they did. Uh, But uh, I asked him, has he ever woken up with strange marks or scars on his body? And his eyes became quite wide. And he said, yes, that happens to me fairly regularly. And in fact, I have one right now. And he showed me this triangular shaped bruise on his arm. And he says, these things just appear overnight. I don't know how they come, but they always heal up quite quickly. Does this mean anything? And I said, well, yes, it could. It might be an indication of UFO contact. It's certainly one of the indicators. And I asked him, has he had any other unusual experiences, perhaps in childhood? Because as investigators know, if a person is a UFO contactee, they will often have childhood encounters. And James immediately said, yes, he had. As a really young boy, he had a little toy phone. And he said this toy phone would often start beeping by itself. And he thought that was very unusual. And I asked him, has he ever seen strange figures entering into his bedroom? anything like that and he said well no not into his bedroom but he did have a very unusual experience when he was around 10 or 11 years old while staying at his uncle's ranch in Oregon his uncle lived in a very rural area surrounded by a pine tree forest James was instructed never to go out into the forest that there are wild animals there and that he could get lost And of course, that's the first thing James did, was start exploring the forest around this ranch. And one morning, he's out in the forest, sitting on a log, poking the ground with a stick, when he looks up and sees two very strange figures, who we would probably describe as typical greys. At the time, as a kid, he had no idea about such things but I'll just let him describe this incident in his own words. And it is quite possible I have been a UFO contactee. I have no recollection of that, but I did see two very white-skinned men in a forest on my uncle's ranch when I was nine. And um, I looked up, and there they were, and I looked down at the ground because I knew I'd be in trouble, and then I went, I thought they were weird looking. And then I went, wait a minute, they're not supposed to be here. This is my uncle's ranch. And I looked back and they were gone. They were looking directly at me. But the, those big ferns they have in Oregon, you know, they're really giant, as tall as a man. They were standing behind two of those. They were right in front of them. And it was a forest. So, But this was a clearing in the forest. I was sitting on a log, this kind of meadow thing. And it was just magnificent. I was just sort of sitting on the log, doodling in the sand with a stick, just being a kid, right, and enjoying the day, right? And I just kind of felt, like, weird, like something was, or called my attention. You know, I was nine, so I didn't really articulate it to myself, but I felt something over there. And I just kind of looked, and I saw them, and I was like, oh, and then I looked down really fast, because I was not supposed to be in the forest. That was the first thing they told me. Do not go in that forest alone. You know, because it's dangerous. You can find your way out. You'll get lost. There's all sorts of dangerous animals in there. Blah, blah, blah. So, anyway, that was the first place I went. But that's just backup for what happened in the later years. But I never, until I met you, really put all that together and all the other stuff that's happened. Well, it was so fast, because in my child's mind, my first thing when I saw them was, oh, God, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm not supposed to be in the forest. I just got busted, right? 
And then I was like, wait a minute. They didn't look right. Did I see that? And it was like, well, what are they doing in the forest? This is my uncle's forest. Who the hell are they? And I look back up, and they were gone. So, yes, this appears to be a close encounter with gray ETs and is another very strong clue that James may be a contactee. So at this point, I asked James if he had ever seen any other UFOs or had missing time. And again, his jaw dropped, his eyes became wide, and he said, actually, yes, I did have a UFO sighting and missing time. And it's something he had forgotten about for some time, uh, but uh, definitely remembered it. As a young man, he and three friends had gone on a boating trip in the San Francisco Delta. It was late in the evening, and they were enjoying themselves on this boat. Uh, there were no other boats around. It was pitch black at night, and they had just finished dinner when suddenly, looking up, they saw a very bright red and white dazzling object drop down out of the sky right over their boat and disappear. It was very obvious, quite large, very bright, and almost as if it wanted to be seen. They all oohed and odd and freaked out a little bit. Just a few moments later, this was followed by a, another bright emerald green light or object which dropped down out of the sky very low right over their boat and again disappeared. The next thing they know, they're waking up. They're not sure how much time had passed, an hour, perhaps two, but they wake up, they're on the deck of their boat, they had literally fallen asleep where they sat. They just keeled over and fell unconscious right on top of each other, all in the group. This was very peculiar. They could not believe that they had fallen asleep so quickly right there on the deck of the boat. That's something that they would never have done. They could not explain it. Nobody even tried to explain it. They didn't talk about it at all and instead just shuffled back into their cabins and went to bed for the evening and it was never discussed after that. This is another strong indicator of UFO contact where people do not discuss a very profound UFO sighting. So this is a clear-cut case of missing time. I think probably something more happened than just this sighting, though James has no memory of it. At this point, I asked him another question I ask of all contactees. Have you ever dreamt about UFOs or aliens? And again, James became quite surprised and said yes. I've had UFO dreams my entire life, ever since I was a little boy, over and over again. It's a repetitive dream that's pretty much always the same with slight variations. He dreams that a UFO arrives and lands, in many cases, in his dream. And he's not scared, but many people around him are scared. And it's his job to calm people down and to instruct them to get on board the UFO. And they do. They all go on board, and he goes on board, and the UFO takes off. And I asked him for a specific example, and he said the most vivid dream that he could remember involved him being at a carnival fairground, and there was a ride that's known as the spin-out, or perhaps the tilt-a-whirl, it's a ride which is shaped as a round disc. It's got little sort of compartments all along the edge, and it spins really quickly. People get it into the little compartments along the edge, and as this object spins, the floor drops out, and people stick to the walls uh, by centrifugal force. And he says in this dream, he was ordering people to get on this carnival ride, and they all did. They got onto their little slots. James got on board. He got into his slot, and this carnival ride starts spinning quickly. The floor begins to drop out, at which point it turns into a UFO. These compartments sort of encase each person, and this UFO takes off and flies off into outer space. 
So this is another uh, strong indication of UFO contact. So I think probably, yes, James is a UFO contactee. And uh, he was quite shocked to find out all these details connected. He had never really looked at them all in the totality. And uh, I, he now believes, or uh, following this, he believed he was probably a UFO contactee. I told James's story uh, in its entirety in my book, On Board UFO Encounters. It is absolutely one of the strangest and most unusual stories of UFO contact I have ever heard. And uh, that's really why I wanted to share it with all of you, because it is profoundly strange, very unusual with unique elements. But I think it shows how a person can spend m much of their life uh, being a UFO contactee and never even know it because all the only indicators are just uh, these few clues. Scars on the body, dreams, sightings of strange figures, uh, UFO encounters, missing time, this sort of thing. Uh, and I think this case is also important because it shows how strange UFO contact can be. I'm not sure what to make of the whole Atlantean bracelet, uh, but it is what it is. So that's James's story. I hope you've enjoyed it and found it interesting. I want to thank you once again for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for the truth, keep asking questions, and keep having fun.